having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he has shed forth this, which you now see and hear. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful to be in your house tonight. We're thankful for our risen Lord. I pray that as we look into the subject of Lordship, that you would give us understanding. May it benefit us spiritually. May the lost come to confess Christ as Lord. Go with us and help us, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Sorry to drink in front of you. I, uh, people with Parkinson's don't feel thirst. And so a lot of times I'll go all day without drinking, I get in the pulpit and I feel weak and I remember I haven't drank all day. Okay. I've got a sermon here somewhere. Having trouble with it today. One of the dear sisters went out and finally found my Bible. The sermon, I appreciate that very much. I've enjoyed getting to know the church here better and rejoice in what God is doing for you. And I've also enjoyed getting to know your pastor better and hope that we can be a blessing to each other. In Genesis 1, verse 26, we read, And God said, Let us make man in our image and after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and the, every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his image image in the image of God created he him male and female created he them and God said bless them and God said be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon earth if there is any teaching in scripture that shows us what is going on and what God is doing and where things are going. It's the doctrine of the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Now, the most basic confession that we as Christians make is that Jesus is Lord. But there's something sad, and that is many times we really don't know fully what that means. And so it's my desire tonight that God would help me to expound what is meant when we say that Jesus is Lord. And the, the Sunday school lesson this morning made a good introduction to this service. God created the universe in six days. In verse 1 through 5, as he conducted his work of creation, at the end of each day, he would say, it was good. And uh, it was good. You think of the various things that God did. God said, let there be light. You know how fast light goes? 186,000 miles per second. That's fast, a lot faster than anything that man could ever build. Uh, God created seeds. And you can take one seed and plant wheat, and you can go on planting wheat for a million years from that one seed that reproduces. We think of the rain. God can move great amounts of moisture across an ocean and pour it out on a desert where it's needed. And so God does so many things that are good. But the sixth day, when God created man, he looked down and he said it was very good. Now, the reason that it went from good to very good is 
because man is the purpose of creation. This creation was created for man and for his benefit and for his use. And until man came, the manor doesn't have the Lord of the manor. And the mansion doesn't have someone to live in it. Now, what did God mean when he told Adam to take dominion? Well, first of all, he was to learn what he had. God told man to name the animals and the plants. Naming them was an act of dominion, just as scientists give names to plants and animals, and the names are descriptive. So when God told Adam to name the plants and the animals, he was describing them, and he was learning what they're used for, their genetic potential. Let me, let me show you what I mean. God brought the horse before Adam. And I'm sure Adam looked at it and said, what a beautiful animal, what a wonderful God that creates such things. But you know, it's not really that simple. There's little tiny short horses. There's great big horses. There's fast horses and strong horses and black horses and white horses. And uh, just everything you can imagine, hundreds of recognized types of horses. But the genetic capacity to breed all those different kinds of horses is found in the first horse. And so Adam was to learn that you could take plants and take animals and breed them for purposes that you uh, had need of. You take, for instance, the dog. Once again, there's big dogs and little dogs. There's dogs that hunt, dogs that are service animals, dogs that do all kinds of jobs for man. Or you take corn, for instance. You have field corn that dries in the field and feeds animals. You have sweet corn that men like to eat. You have Indian corn and popcorn and miniature corn. All of these special types of corn that are for the good of man. And Adam was given the task of learning what uh, you could do with these things and how to breed them. You think of other gifts that God gave to us. Electricity. What would our life be like without electricity? No hair dryers. No electric stoves, no lights. It would be terrible. But God gave us electric, and men have figured out how to make electric. You can make it by solar energy, make it by moving water, make it by wind, make it by fossil fuel, make it by nuclear energy. And then you have men like Thomas Edison, that can take this electric that men make and do all kinds of things for our good and for our benefit. And so you see, Adam was placed in this earth to learn what he had and what God had given him. You think of the great men of earth. I mentioned Thomas Edison, who did so much with electric. We think of men like Louis Pasteur that cured diseases. We think of Newton, who was the greatest scientist that ever lived. George Washington Carver, who worked with the peanut. We think of the Wright brothers and how they benefited man with the ability to fly. And we think of Henry Ford. We came here tonight with cars. and We're blessed to live in an age when we have such things. And then we... Now think of athletes, the first man to run the mile in one minute. We think of men like Muhammad Ali, the great boxer. We think of companies that set money aside for research and development. All sorts of things, plants that have healing properties, that uh, make food for millions. This was the job that Adam was given, to learn what he had. It was also his job to learn what he didn't have. Notice 
Genesis 2, verse 18. And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a help, meet for him. And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called them, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to all the cattle and to the fowl of the air and to the beasts of the field. But for Adam there was not found to help meet for him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh thereof, and, and of the rib which the Lord God had taken from the man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. Adam thought he had everything that he needed. But God created Eve, and God brought Eve to Adam, and he figured out very quickly that he had need of something else. And I believe that Eve was the most beautiful thing that he had ever seen. And I believe he praised God for the woman. And it's important. We live in a day where these matters are so confused and people act like they don't know the difference between a man and a woman. You know, I'm not a PhD, but I know the difference between a man and a woman. And I'll tell you something, we'd be up a crick if we didn't have women. First of all, even if men figured out a way to have babies, there wouldn't any of them live. If all you had was men. I remember when I was married, we soon were expecting, and uh, my wife and baby we're in the hospital, and my wife became ill. The baby was well. I don't know if they still do this now, but they wouldn't let the baby stay in the hospital with the mother, so I had to bring the baby home. Them nurses were so worried. They just couldn't imagine that. And you know, I have kind of a dry sense of humor, and the nurse said, that, you know what to feed the baby? I said, oh, hot dogs and stuff. <laughs> and uh, man, <laughs> they were really worried. But you know, women like babies. I like them too. But women really like babies. And uh, Adam soon learned that he had need of something. And I believe, you know that Adam adored Eve because Satan used Eve to cause Adam to fall. He took that which was most precious to him. And so he learned what he had need of. And you know, 1 Peter 3 and verse 7 says that they were, were to live with a woman according to knowledge. And let me say this to the man, the men that are here, when you consider the corn and the dog and the horse and all the wonderful things that God made and how we're to learn. So Peter said you're to live with your wife according to knowledge. Men and women are different. And if you don't learn to dwell with your spouse according to knowledge, you may have real problems soon. And so Adam was Lord. God chose man and made him Lord of this universe and gave him dominion. You know, God said, take dominion and learn the things that you can do with what God has given you. And men were to take dominion. And so Adam was Lord. Our first point was that Adam was Lord. Our second point is that Satan wanted to be Lord. 
Let's look at this a few moments, this business that Satan wanted to be Lord. Why did Satan have such a satanic hatred of man? Why did he want the human race to fall? Well, I'll give you four reasons. First of all, sin works in men and angels. It has an effect on them. It makes them selfish. Instead of being glad what God had done for man, Satan was angry that he was not placed in charge, and he was jealous, he was envious, and he developed a hatred for man. Another reason is mentioned in Psalm 8 where it says that the man was made a little lower than the angels. And Satan knew that he was smarter than Adam. He knew that he was stronger than Adam. And it aggravated him that Adam was made Lord and that Adam was made higher than he was. Another reason is given in Hebrews 1 verse 14. It says the angels are ministering spirits sent to minister to them that shall be heirs of salvation. When Adam found out that his job was going to be to help, when Satan found out that it was going to be his job to help Adam, oh, that irritated him to no end. He thought that man should be his servant, and that's the way it would have been if it had gone as things usually do. And then last of all, Satan was aggravated that when man was made, he was not made in the image of angels. He was made in the likeness of man. And so Satan caused Adam to fall. And then he rushed in to usurp the authority that God had given to Adam. And Adam became the God of this world. Think of that expression, the God of this world. And that's what Adam is, or rather what Satan is doing now. He's usurping. He's uh, Fighting against man, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in high places. It's a, a sad thing. Now, there's two portions of Scripture that are very strange. You might turn, for instance, to Isaiah 14, and we'll look at these for a moment. Sin had an effect on Adam. It, and on Satan, too, it made them selfish and evil in their thinking of man. Now, in Isaiah 14, it takes the king of Babylon, and it talks about him. But pretty soon, things are being said that could only be true of Almighty God. In Isaiah 14 and verse 12, I'm in the wrong scripture. Isaiah 14. Isaiah 14 and verse 12. It says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the earth, which did weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. And so the clouds are symbols of God's glory. And Satan says, I will ascend above the heights of the cloud. I'll be more glorious than God is. If you go to Ezekiel 28, you see another example. There it's the Prince of Tyre, and it begins talking about the Prince of Tyre, but pretty soon you find out that it's talking about somebody greater than the literal Prince of Tyre. It's talking about Satan. Ezekiel 28 and verse 11. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation. 
on the king of Tyrus and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Thou hast been in the Eden, the garden of God. Let me ask you a question. When was the prince of Tyre ever in Eden, the garden of God? Well, this is what is said of him. And it says, every precious stone was thy covering. And it mentions the various valuable stones that were a covering for the anointed cherub. In verse 14, thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast thou upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created till iniquity was found in thee. Now think about that. It says that you were perfect. Was the prince of Tyre ever perfect? But this being that is spoken of was perfect in beauty and until the day that he fell. What is God saying there? Why would he take these mortal men, these rulers, and speak of them as though they were uh, God and then uh, talk about their fall? Well, I think he was describing what sin does to men. I think of many of the leaders in our world. It's sad to think about them. They, they're put in office. And they hunger after power. And they want to be glorious. And it's because of what sin does to man. And so you read Isaiah 14, you read Ezekiel 28, and you see that leaders and people in power are always going to be corrupted by sin. And uh, that is what sin has done to them. When the Bible describes the nations in the book of Daniel, it describes them as terrible beasts. And we think in the dear country in which we live, you think of abortion and all the terrible things that have taken place. Men become twisted by sin. Jesus said that Satan was a, a liar and a murderer. And that is spoken of of ordinary men and John 8 and verse 44. So Satan was Lord. Adam was Lord. Satan wanted to be Lord. But here's the good part of the sermon. Jesus is Lord. Adam was Lord, but he fell. He lost the ability to take dominion. He now had to labor by the sweat of his brow. He now had to deal with all sorts of problems. So Adam was Lord. Satan wanted to be Lord, but Jesus is Lord. Now, what do we mean when we say that Jesus is Lord? I'm going to use two big words, but I'm going to explain them. There are two types of lordship. There is, first of all, ontological lordship. Ontological means according to the nature of things. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit all have all power. They all are without limitations. They're infinite, infinite in presence, infinite in knowledge, infinite in power. Now, if you know everything, if you have all power, your Lord. But there's another type of lordship. This is mediatorial lordship. Look, if you will, in Philippians 2. Philippians 2. And we notice why Jesus became Lord, and it tells us something about his lordship. Philippians 2, verse 5, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Notice, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Now let's stop there. It says that 
Jesus Christ is man. He's God, fully God, but he's also man, fully man. And he humbled himself. He took upon himself the form of a servant. He died a terrible death, the death of the Roman cross. And what happened to him because of that? Well, notice in verse 9, wherefore. Because Jesus humbled himself and died on the cross. Wherefore, God has also highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow and every tongue should confess. It says that he should, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow and all, the, all things in heaven and earth and under the earth and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now, take a hold of this. Jesus is God. But Jesus is not called Lord because he's God. He's called Lord because he's a man. You see, Adam was made Lord. Adam was a man. Satan usurped the authority of Adam. Jesus Christ, 2,000 years ago, came to this world, was laid in a manger in Bethlehem. He became man, a very real man, man in every way. And he suffered and died for our sins was buried and rose again. And the Bible says that God has given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow. See, the Bible, the Bible speaks of the first Adam and the last Adam. The first Adam was made there in the garden, but he failed and he sinned. But he sent another Adam. The Bible calls this Adam the last Adam. You know, this is really deep, and I say this because I'm throwing out a nugget. If there's a theologian here, you may want to think about this. Jesus is called the first Adam. You know what the word first in the Greek is? It's eschatological. The eschatological Adam. The first Adam. There's a lot of meaning there that I won't even attempt to get into, but Jesus Christ his Lord. He's the first, the last Adam, the second man. Notice, if you will, the book of Daniel. We're told something in the book of Daniel that's really interesting. Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7, verse 13 and 14. It says, And I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. And there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people and nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. Now notice what it says. The Son came before the Ancient of Days, the Father, and the Father gave him dominion and glory and a kingdom and people and nations and languages that they should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion. And so all that is true of the Son. But look, if you will, in verse 13, and notice what it says about the Son. And I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of God. Did I read something wrong there? Look at verse 13 again. I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of God. I'm reading it wrong, aren't I? It said, one like the Son of Man. And so Jesus is not called Lord because he's God. He's called Lord because he became the last Adam and he will take dominion 
I think of what we're told in Genesis 1. It says that Adam was to take dominion, and he was in taking dominion to take dominion over the things above him, the birds of the air, the things that be below him. And the things that are around him, the creeping animals. And so at Jesus Christ was given lordship. Adam was given lordship. Adam was uh, given lordship and told to take dominion. Again, the things under the earth, the things above the earth, the, the things around him. But Jesus Christ was given a greater dominion. He was to be... Lord of the things in heaven, the things under the earth, even hell, and the things in the earth. And so Jesus Christ is Lord. Now let me make a few comments before we go any further. Have you ever heard some preacher say, make Jesus Lord? Do you ever think how ridiculous that is? You can't make Jesus Lord. The Father already made him Lord. Jesus Christ is Lord. The Bible says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. The Bible says, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. But we believe that through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ we shall be saved even as they. And so Jesus Christ has a lordship that was given him by the Father. You cannot make Jesus Lord, but you must bow to his lordship. To, to speak of making Jesus Lord, that, that is utterly foolish. He is Lord. You don't make him Lord, you confess him as Lord. May God help us to understand these things. Now let me ask you a question. I, I'm not going to ask you if Jesus is your Lord because he is. He's everybody's Lord. You know, the, the, the fact that you rob a bank doesn't stop the sheriff from being the sheriff. Jesus Christ is Lord. Every man, every angel, every fallen angel, must confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The question is not will you do it, the question is when will you do it? If you die without Jesus Christ, you'll confess him as Lord, but you'll be cast into hell. But even this night, you can Call upon the name of the Lord. What did Paul say when he met Jesus on the Damascus Road? He said, Lord, who art thou? What did the thief on the cross say to Jesus? Lord, remember me. Will you confess Jesus Christ as Lord? I'm thankful for the dominion that God gave to Adam. I'm thankful for all the things that we've learned to do with God's creation. I'm thankful most of all for my beautiful wife. Jesus Christ is Lord. May God help each of us to live and manifest the Lordship of Christ in our lives and to yield to him. May God bless you.